Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Hello, Phase World Podcast listeners. I am back for part two with Ralph Peterson Jr. I'm actually testing a new mic I just purchased from Amazon. I believe the brand is Yeti. It has all these crazy functionalities. I'm still learning as a podcaster, so if you have any feedback for my recording, the questions I have for my guests, please let me know via phaseworld at gmail.com. You can also drop me a comment on phaseworld.com for each podcast episode or directly via iTunes. So it is 18 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit right now in Boston, completely crazy, and it's going to be this cold for the majority of the week. But you know what's crazy is ever since I started this project and as I was walking uh, out of work and on my way home, I thought to myself, wow, it's so cold. I can actually work on my podcast tonight. What a great way to detox and have some fun. So anyway, part two with Ralph Peterson Jr. If you have not listened to part one, I really highly recommend that you go back to that. In this episode, Ralph will actually teach you the business side of being a musician, including how to stay relevant, what you need to know about the nature of the record business, how to redefine your own success, technology as a great equalizer, and why you should own your own label. Besides that, Ralph opened up about wanting to be a musician's musician. It was the first time for me to hear that uh, terminology. So what it means in Ralph's own words is, if you honestly play music, then people will feel it. But if you play music to people, when they change, your music will have to change. Ralph also opened up about his own addiction that he overcame 19 years ago. He said to me that the recovery process really is about self-love. I hope you all enjoyed this podcast episode. Keep in mind that all the show notes, resources, and tools and links are available via phaseworld.com. And again, I welcome your feedback and thank you so much for being part of my podcast and enjoy the show. Here comes Ralph Peterson Jr. who have heard and who possess more music than I do, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not a record collector. I'm a student of music. Mm-hmm. So I may not have all the records, but the records I know, I know better than most people, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so I've had this, you know, I have this kind of conversation almost every semester with students who walk around with these um, terabyte hard drives, 10 terabytes, right? Mm-hmm. I say, how many tunes you got on that thing? Mm-hmm. And they say, oh, well, I got, you know, I stick your chest out, I got 80,000 songs on it. Mm-hmm. I say, oh, yeah, how many solos can you sing? Mm-hmm. Not play, just sing, mm-hmm. you know, from that. And they're like, what do you mean? Why I got to sing the solos? Mm-hmm. I said, because singing the solos is learning the vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And why does a drummer have to learn how to sing a saxophone solo? Mm-hmm. So that he knows how to ornament a saxophone solo, right? If you, if you only think like drummers and you only listen to drummers, then you're only gonna sound like a drummer. And I think that one of the reasons I've been able to stay relevant is that I play music 
on the drums. That that what I play, that my approach, my concept towards drumming transcends solely drumming. Mm -hmm. And that's not an accident. That's something that has developed over time and with intent. Mm -hmm. And so it's you have to you have to um, identify mm -hmm. what your after you find your bliss, you gotta find your gift, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And start to build your career on that. And then as times change, you have to learn how to keep it relevant, which is why you know we started out talking about the possibility of doing um, video, podcasts of video lessons from this music room and how excited I am. Because that's gonna help um, redefine me as a brand. Onyx Productions, my record label, I have Mm -hmm. Of the of the eighteen records I've done as a leader, four have been on my own label, you know, and so <clears throat> I'm constantly expanding and redefining who I am as an artist mm -hmm. and as a businessman, in 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 the in the attempt to stay relevant and stay fresh. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kids who study with me that haven't heard my records. Mm -hmm. Because of my, a lot of my records have been put out of print. Mm. Not because they weren't popular, but because the nature of the record business mm -hmm. is to only keep a record relevant and in play yeah, for, so for five months. at the most. <laughs> five months you know, months. five months at the most. <laughs> and, and so, um, but that's because the record business is not about the art of music. Right. It's about the art of selling things. I, you know, if my mom were here, you know, she's been, as you know, she's been a professional artist. Mm -hmm. And she echoes the exact same uh, pain point. As you know, you go to galleries today. It's not a pain right? point. Only mm -hmm. It's only painful <laughs> if you don't accept it. Right. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I was going to say that at the galleries today, you look at these paintings and I, we all think to ourselves, like, how could they be selling such artworks? I mean, and then you see people on TV, on radio, people with no training. I mean, modern art today, some of that has turned into uh, duct tape, you know, floating around on the surface, and and, and it's yeah. just videos yeah. of nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. And so. And the more, the more like that it is on the surface, the more hidden mm -hmm. the politics of right. all of it is. Yeah. And so. You have to start as an artist uh, about 10 years ago. I started to redefine what success was for me. Mm -hmm. And not because I had done and made six records on the Blue Note label. So, you know, a lot of these young guys who are flavoring a month on Blue Note who are on their second and third record and think they're gonna live forever, mm. they don't know what I know. Mm. <laughs> okay? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And 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 um coming into the middle part of my career when I started recording with small independence, because I had come from most artists go from putting out their own record to independence to trying to get to a major label. And if you're not careful, you'll look at my progression as being backwards, but my progression fits the flow of the industry mm -hmm. because technology has become the great equalizer mm -hmm. where a person or a couple of people can sit down and infiltrate the internet mm -hmm. on the same professional level as some multinational corporation. Mm -hmm. I think there's a myth. There are so many myths like embedded in every industry. In mm -hmm. finance, right? Like uh, you know, Tony Robbins recently wrote a book about why ever you know why everybody should not invest in mutual funds. The so called quote unquote small fee that we charge you is a benefit to you. Turns out it's not true. Right. And you know, I think the same goes for uh, many other industries as well. What I learned as a, you know, if somebody's a writer or an author, you publish a book, there's so little you can get out of the book. Right. And as a musician, I heard that by selling an album, you get a f small fraction 
of if you cost. don't own it. <laughs> right, exactly. If you don't own it. And so what mm-hmm. I've discovered by becoming a, 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 a <laughs> By becoming a person, a label owner, and a person who makes, who's in the record-making business. Mm. See, I got to footnote this with a story. Mm -hmm. Uh, About 20 years ago, I was at a festival in Malta with a great saxophone player named Gary Bartz. And, you know, it was 20 years ago, so I was barely 30-something. And we were talking about being in the record business and how the record business sucks and man, this record business. <laughs> and he kind of shook his head, looked us, and finally he got. He's like, "Man, you guys aren't in the record business." Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Well, what do you mean? You know, I'm with Blue Note, major label, blah blah blah." Mm-hmm. He said, "No, but that's not being in the record business. That's not being in the record making business." <laughs> yeah. He said, "That's being an employee." Yeah, you're a freelancer, of, not an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're an employee of somebody in the record business. Yeah. He said, "Cause you don't own nothing, mm-hmm. right?" So, so what I've learned now, becoming fully up to my eyeballs in the record business, mm-hmm. is that. Making the record, given today's technology and with recording and programs and how you can carry a recording studio around mm. in your laptop and all you need is, you know, mm. to spend a few thousand dollars on mics yeah. and get in the right place and you can make a record anywhere. Wow. The most important, the most expensive thing about making a record now isn't making it. It's about getting it heard. Yeah, marketing. Aspect. Publishing. Yeah. Publicists, publici- not publishing, but publicity. Publicists cost me twice what I spent on payroll for the last record that I made. That's a counterintuitive fact to young musicians who haven't stepped into your, you know. They don't know. Hope. They don't. They ain't thinking nothing, nothing about that. <laughs> they ain't thinking nothing about that. Yeah. They're not thinking. That if they are fortunate enough to get signed with a major label, that if they don't put a clause in their contract that says that the company mm-hmm. must foot the bill on public on on the publicist for the entire period of the release, yeah, yeah, right, or for or for a fixed period like a year, then they're going to get all the records out, and then as soon as the company does that, mm-hmm. they're going to turn towards the next project Mm -hmm. that they're looking to put out Mm -hmm. and that record that project that they put out is expected to sink or swim on its own Mm -hmm. and uh america is still a place where people buy what they're told to buy (laughs) yeah and if you can't get on the radar you can't get in the game Mm -hmm. you know and so uh it's a constant evolving and shifting of the playing field. The rules are fair because, you know, they're jacked up for everybody. Everybody's got to play by the same, but you got to, you got to be mindful of, of where on the field the game is being played. Yeah. Right? If you are trying to run up the sideline and they're playing the game in the middle of the field or vice versa, you're just not going to have success. So I've had, I've had moderate success and I'm comfortable you're too modest for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm comfortable with the with the person I am professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't I haven't sold out kind of character principles, you know, um, of uh, standing for one thing or appearing to stand for one thing, mm-hmm. and and actually being about. Appearing to stand for the solution, mm-hmm. but you know when the lights go out and the doors close, you're back in bed with the problem makers. Let me ask you a, a slightly different question. Um, my mom is an artist, and many musicians I know, they feel so they get so easily irritated when it comes to marketing, like just in the realm of marketing and advertising themselves, so their work, or having to make certain accommodations or adjustments as a result. Are you? Do you feel like you're on the same line? Do you get excited about marketing yourself, your band, or do you rather give it to somebody else to do that for you? I think that there are people better at it than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but they have to know my story. Mm-hmm. 
some marketers market based on formulas and it doesn't matter who the artist is. They just plug the artist in the formula and they market based on the formula. Mm-hmm. Um, my life hasn't been unique, but there are, it's been a story. It's been a story worth telling. Mm-hmm. And it's a story that isn't all peaches and cream. It isn't all roses. Sometimes it's thorns. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It isn't all... It isn't all a bowl of cherries. Sometimes it's the pits. Mm-hmm. But it isn't... It, it isn't until... You understand that part of my story... Mm-hmm. That you can recognize... Why I say some of the things I say... And how I feel about the way I feel. You know... Mm-hmm. Um, it becomes a matter of the perception is changed by the perspective. The perspective is changed by the perception, mm-hmm. right? Because if you're on the outside and you say, oh, well, you know, Ralph Peterson appears to be this famous jazz musician. Mm-hmm. And then you come inside and you say, here's a guy who, you know, yeah, he came from a musical family, mm-hmm. but he's not a jazz baby. He came up playing funk and R&B. But he wanted to play jazz because it was a more musical challenge, Mm -hmm. right? It was the challenge of the music that drew me to jazz, not the quest to be famous Mm -hmm. or to be popular. I want to be considered the best, and not even by popular standards, you know? I really want to be the musician's musician. And I don't have a problem with with saying that. A lot of artists say, well, if you don't play music for the people, if you honestly play music, then people will feel it. If you play music to people, then they may feel it for a while, Mm -hmm. but when their feelings change, you're going to have to change. I really like where you're going with this, and um, this reminds me of uh, Maria Popova, who was a a very famous writer. Now she runs a blog with Mm -hmm. over three to five million unique visitors every month. She says publicly she writes for the audience of one. Yeah. If she. That's a Miles Davis concept. (laughs) Miles Davis used to say. I've been known to play for one, <laughs> you know, and a lot of people, including my mother, would would talk smack. Why are you? Why are you listening to Miles Davis? He only plays for himself. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and and there are a lot of. I find it funny, mm-hmm. almost. Uh, hysterically, hypocritical. <laughs> Some musicians who while riding the crest of a wave of popularity which has more to do with the politics of the label they're on or the money they've spent in marketing and publicity which is which is what makes them visible go on these diatribes about playing music about simplifying the music and dumbing you know we don't don't pl- now, don't play music that people you know can't relate to. Well, people can relate to anything that's honest, and regardless of how complex your music is, if it is presented and performed honestly, not arrogantly, then people will latch on to it. People will latch on to it, mm-hmm. even if they don't understand it. Mm-hmm. They can connect with the level of passion, or they can connect with the exuberance and the fun that you're obviously having. I, I've had people come up to me many times after concerts and say, this is the first time I've heard a real jazz concert, and mm-hmm. I didn't understand anything, but you guys look like you were having so much fun. <laughs> I right? know but but that's, what yeah. Yeah. that's what kept them. That's what kept them. And if you can get people like that to come back again... Eventually, they'll start to understand the language of your music mm-hmm. and hear that sense of exuberance or commitment or passion or sadness or melancholy, whatever you're trying to project through a particular musical moment, 
they'll hear it and then they get you you know and that's and see that way that audience doesn't you don't have to chase that audience mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to as a musician no well you shouldn't have to as an artist mm -hmm. you know there's there's the musician the artist and then there's the musician the populist the kind of product person who who discovers or recognizes a formula and then allows like a black hole all of their creative energy to be sucked into that formula mm -hmm. and so the, the formula becomes more important than the artistry mm -hmm. right how how many things how many times can we do this thing over and over again mm -hmm. Yeah, to generate money before somebody realizes we're doing the same thing over and over again. But this is a, you know, since I haven't interviewed a ton of musicians just yet, uh, you know, my friend Barry, whom I introduce you to, is running a company, a competition mm -hmm. uh, with his partner to provide a, a platform to foster that environment so that musicians, once they go beyond college or post-graduate, could continue their, um, to find a voice, mm -hmm. um, sort of what they do, uh, and also other people who can relate to them. With that said, you know, I feel like this whole idea, the post popular topic of passion versus money versus reality, you know, people started to, to break down if money becomes an issue. I don't mean excessive amount of money, mm -hmm. but, you know, I would love to play for myself. This is what I believe in. You know, as a seasoned musician, how does one 20, 30 year old balance that? Like, what have you learned today that you go back 30 years ago and tell your 20 year old self? What another 20 year old from, from Berkeley, I guess. I would probably, <laughs> I would, you know, I would have probably made some other decisions regarding romantic relationships and how far <laughs> I waded in as early as I did. Mm. I think that there was a period in my life where other successful young jazz musicians in the Renaissance were getting married. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I thought, not knowing <clears throat> what to do next, I looked around at what everybody else was doing <laughs> next, and so. I did that, and it wasn't necessarily the best thing for me. I don't have now. Having said that, I don't have any regrets. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly. It's easy to look back and say I would have spared myself the ass kicking from addiction, mm -hmm. but I don't know what my music would sound like if I hadn't gone through that. Interesting. Uh, this is a. I wanted to talk about addiction since you brought it up. If that's okay. It's okay with me. It's okay with you know, me, yeah. Um, I mean, it might make some other people uncomfortable, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I can mark the episode. What I, you know, for me, the the interesting part is my parents are both, you know, my dad passed away and, you know, uh, when he was alive and he was a very talented artist. Uh -huh. and, um, I didn't know that. He, yeah, a calligrapher. Okay. He drew... And he had his own addictions um, with the alcohol, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with cigarettes. I know that yeah. sounds no, easy listen, going, but it's not. You know, I get ten years ago, I gave up no. cigarettes. Uh, jazz musicians, some jazz musicians, like Charlie Parker, like John Coltrane, early John Coltrane, um, like Earl, like Philly Joe Jones. You know. There are many jazz musicians throughout history who struggled with addiction. Um, the reasons that, that people escape through substances outside of themselves have as much to do with the days and times that they live in externally as they do with what's going on inside of a person uh, internally. What do I mean when I say that? Um, for me, my experience has taught me that addiction is an inability to process feelings. Therefore, you you subsidize or or mask 
mm-hmm. you know, these overwhelming feelings or inability to process them mm-hmm. through some person, place, or thing outside yourself. Mm-hmm. That could be shopping, that could be eating, that could be smoking cigarettes, that could be doing cocaine, that could be shooting heroin, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Um, it isn't until you start to understand the disease concept of addiction that you understand that those five things I mentioned are the same. Mm -hmm. They're the same. Mm -hmm. And that it doesn't matter whether, it doesn't matter what you use. What's important about addiction, and I don't want to turn this into an NA meeting, (laughs) because I can't. I don't speak for the fellowship. I can only speak through my experience. But what's, what's important about addiction is the using. And why you use. So uh, that's what I had to get in touch with. I had to get in touch with my feelings of not being enough and where that came from and being alone in a, in a, in a crowd of adults. So I was the youngest, mm-hmm. all right? But I was also the baby boy. So that made me the boy Prince King mm-hmm. spoiled brat, mm-hmm. you know. And, but I was also a junior. There's a whole pathology Mm -hmm. that only people who are the seconds, the thirds, and or juniors can understand. It's a weight that people who don't have that suffix Mm -hmm. cannot relate to. They just can't because they don't have the experience. They don't, you know. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things uniquely balled up. Um, led to my pathology, and let me let me state this unequivocally. I liked getting high. I liked separating from those feelings because it was a temporary, momentary relief. The problem is, as soon as I as soon as the high was over, the problem is the problem with all addiction. The problem is still there, and most of the time it's magnified. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so um, I remember having a conversation with a great jazz trombonist named Curtis Fuller, who played with Art Blakey and is a part of uh, a generation of jazz musicians that were my age mm-hmm. when modern jazz was created. Okay, so so at 52, I'm at a point now where the guys, when he told me this story, he was maybe five or ten years older than me, because it had to be 20, 25 years ago, Mm -hmm. right? So he said, man, I don't know what you guys are getting high for. You ain't got, you ain't going through none of what we had to go through, Mm -hmm. you know? And what he was talking about was having to enter the venue that you were performing in through the back door because no black person could walk through the front door mm-hmm. or or playing in a, in a ballroom where they're serving food and you can't eat there mm-hmm. you know that's I have certain I have certain uh, peculiarity peculiar tendencies mm-hmm. of, that I'm a stickler about when I'm on the road and one of the things is especially now that I'm clean, is that I want to eat what everybody else is eating. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in banned food. Mm-hmm. There's, there's the food that every... And if you want to charge me for it, well, I'm going to make sure I charge you enough that I can afford to buy the food I want. Mm-hmm. Right? Because I want to be treated like any other person. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I should be able to command a fee that allows me to eat on the same level as the people I'm playing for. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, because if I'm not able to do that, then you're not paying me enough, and I haven't asked for enough. So I gotta ask, why have I undersold myself? Mm -hmm. And a lot of musicians undersell themselves because they're they're thinking about eating this week, Mm -hmm. or today, or this month making the rent this month, Mm -hmm. you know. And so as you get older, you try to see farther down the road. Mm -hmm. You try to have three months in the bag, six months in the bag, 
And I, you know, I think like patience is something I developed as I, as I with myself age over the past 10 years, <laughs> you know, everything, I think technology with a lot of things we talked about just now, everything has to happen instantly. Right? Well, patience yeah. makes people less, pa- I mean, technology makes people, people less patient, Yeah, absolutely. you know, and so the young, the young people now have it harder than you had it or mm-hmm. I had mm-hmm. because the technology says, click it, click it. It's not coming fast enough. Click yeah. it again. Yeah. You know, it, you know, and yeah. so. In the speed that it takes to re- hit a return button, they expect answers when sometimes it's the process mm-hmm. of something unfolding mm-hmm. that is the most important part of the learning experience. Mm-hmm. So, I don't, I'm not sure how, how we got here. How we got here, but it has to do with questions that students ask me or I wish they would ask. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that I don't hear is, oh, no, let me put it this way. Let me deal in the positive. One of the things I love hearing is when a student comes to me and says, man, I've been working on this thing since you gave it to me last year, mm-hmm. and I'm just starting to figure out what I'm supposed to get from it. Because that's how it's supposed to develop. That kid is going to be able to use whatever he discovered in a way to change music, you know, mm-hmm. forever. So, it's a... Uh, but all students are different. You can't... There's no formula for teaching. Mm-hmm. You have to teach uh, each student differently, but you have to stand for something mm-hmm. because students think they know what they're supposed to... Students think they know what they need. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I tell them when they come at me that way is that if you knew what you need needed you wouldn't be here you'd be already out there getting it yeah yeah i like that you know so take the cotton out your ears and stuff it in your mouth (laughs) you know what i mean yeah i I will add this to the previous question uh, for sure okay i um i do want there's one question i I did want to ask about addiction as well is now you've been clean for 19 years 19 years is a long time it could be one of your students age you know yeah and um you know, having been there myself, I wonder what are some of the uh, enlightenment, um, you know, that you experience now. You wish you knew when you're in the darkness, when you're struggling. You know, unfortunately, some that, people... Yeah, that, yeah. that and, and it may sound like a bunch of cliches, but I'll run them. It's a fact that we have feelings, mm-hmm. but not all feelings are facts. Okay. So, in other words, just because I've feel something really strongly doesn't make it true (laughs) doesn't even make it doesn't make it right it doesn't even make it true Mm -hmm. it may just be a product of one of the core elements of my addiction Mm -hmm. which is obsession yeah obsession and the inability to let something go yeah 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 so another one is time takes time Mm -hmm. you know that uh it's important. Another one, a key that I and this goes back to what I, my the observations regarding the relationship choices I made early in my life. Mm-hmm. Never judge your insides by the outsides appearances of other people. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and these are things that uh, I still have to live by today. Mm-hmm. You know, because I can get caught up in, well, you know, I'm this age, I'm supposed to have this amount of money saved, I'm supposed to have this going, I'm supposed to have that. Mm-hmm. I got some things, you know, I mean, I'm living comfortably. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not where I want to be, I'm not where I used to be, though. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it's about forward motion. Mm-hmm. It's about progress, not perfection. Mm-hmm. Because the process of progress is really the gift. Mm -hmm. The only thing you've arrived at when you reach a destination is the new starting point. Mm -hmm. And then to your point, you said you gained not just something, a significant amount of emotions and knowledge through that experience. And it, you know, recovering from the addiction becomes a gift in itself. Because it's about learning who you are. Mm -hmm. And then learning how to love that person. Mm -hmm. I I mean... The, the 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 if addiction is the devil then and evil then the the uh 
the the antithesis or recovery mm -hmm. is about love. Mm -hmm. But it's about loving yourself. It's not a romantic kind of love. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of like self-worth kind of love mm -hmm. where if my life doesn't change at all from today, how do I be okay with me? Mm -hmm. Are you okay with you? I'm real okay with me these days. Yeah. 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 Eternal happiness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like to be slimmer, but I know what I got to do in order <laughs> to get to that. Yeah. You know, I know exactly what I have to do. And what I had, what I've learned recently is that I got to be more realistic mm -hmm. about how to do it. Because at 52, I can't work out like I used to work out at 47. Mm -hmm. My body just won't take the punishment. Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening is I end up having to take long breaks to heal mm -hmm. from trying to work out like a 45 year old mm -hmm. at 52. You know, because because it's not what I do professionally. Mm -hmm. I got some friends that are 50, 52, 55, that are still professional point fighters on the mm -hmm. sport karate circuit. Mm -hmm. But these guys teach karate mm -hmm. for a living. They have their own dojos. And mm -hmm. I have to remember that, you know, I'm not them, I'm me. Mm -hmm. And while I love the art, like you said, my superpower is behind the drum set. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. I can take things that I learned from training in the martial arts and become a better musician, a better teacher. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons why I picked up my training again 10 years ago mm -hmm. was because I wanted to be a. St the reason I started playing trumpet was because I had been playing drums since I was three years old and I wanted, I needed to become a student of music. Mm -hmm. I needed to learn how to read, I needed to learn how to write. I needed. So the reason that I started training again was because I wanted to be uh, become a student and I didn't realize it until maybe this moment, mm -hmm. but what I was becoming a student of is teaching. Mm -hmm. Because from, you know, Grandmaster Artizi, Grandmaster McKinley, Grandmaster Kim, Grandmaster O'Malley, each of those experiences have shaped me now as an instructor who teaches a summer program and some a couple of Berkeley students under my own, mm -hmm. you know, banner. Um, but uh, it's funny, all of my Berkeley, oh, of course, mm -hmm. all of my adult karate students mm -hmm. are musicians. So that's a niche. That's like a really specific niche mm -hmm. that if I decide I wanted to like unwrap mm -hmm. and really make a big thing out of, I could because I know for a fact mm -hmm. that musicians have specific training needs mm -hmm. in terms of having to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to protect their hands. They have to protect their mouths. They have mm -hmm. to, you know, they have to be more careful about, mm -hmm. you know, breaking or certain techniques that may put their livelihood mm -hmm. in jeopardy, right? Mm -hmm. And not all not all diehard martial artists mm -hmm. can relate to that. You know what I mean? No. Some some karate guy woke up, you know, came up sticking his hands in hot burning glass, you know, he's not gonna he's gonna say that's the only way you can become good. Yeah. No, yeah. this is this is really fun and um apologize for going way over that's time. That's all right, that's all right. Um Let's and do part I, one, part two. Yeah, I could, that's exactly what I'm thinking that I'm gonna do. So okay. um I can assemble the pieces together. Yeah, sure, sure. And um I would love to get a piece of your music to open up the um Something exciting, something that you think it's relevant to what we just talked about, um, or deliver the right emotions. And uh, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Pick something here. You listen oh, to all. Yes, of course I do. <laughs> you listen and pick something. Those yeah. are some of my. Nice. I I remember this as. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and these two, Tracy did the artwork on these two. Well, this these two. Tracy, yeah. That's Tracy's. That's too. Tracy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I really like this one. Yeah. It's very you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. That's the most recent. I, l I love the concert you had at Berkeley, and I had no idea how many people were going to be that, I mean, that excited, if you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah. People understand. Um, we're we're going to try to gear up and do that concert in the fall of 
15 again. Wow. Yeah. What's the name of that band, by the way, you're playing with? That that group is The Messenger Legacy. Oh. And, and we're trying to uh, get a recording together now mm-hmm. to put out <clears throat> with that band. Um, that's the band I just toured France with. And we've just got the anchor gig for next summer's tour starting in Vienna, which might include them. Hey, it's Faye. I am back for a few words at the end of the show. I hope you enjoy what you heard. You can visit us online at faceworld.com or social channels such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, also under FaceWorld to keep things simple. I personally review and respond to all the messages. Love to hear from you. Thank you and lots of hugs. See you next week.